Leading us this evening is Star Spangled Banner is Mr. Gallagher. Please rise. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. We are into our, I'm not even sure which night, our sixth night. Um, we've made pretty good progress. We're almost done with the special. Um, we're still debating number 10 ad infinitum. Um, as soon as we're done with that, we're going to go back into the regular town meeting and hopefully move forward and get a bunch of more stuff done. Um, now, are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Seeing none. Um, recognize the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all of the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 14, 2012, at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Any announcements or resolutions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamerson, Precinct 12, and um, co-chair of the Arlington Recycling Committee. Um, on your chairs, you'll see uh, an announcement of our um, buy-in. Twice a year, we have, in the spring and the fall, a community collection day. I'm going to briefly talk about that so the folks at home can have that information. The general information on the back and the e-waste that you can uh, drop off on Saturday without charge or during normal DPW business hours is listed on the back, and is all, both, all this information is available on the website. Um, sorry, there's no party favors in the way of bags this year. Um, those are on order, the Uncle Sam bags. But in the back, there are some recycling and uh, yard waste stickers for those who need some of those. And those, too, are available at the Department of Public Works uh, on Grove Street in their new offices. So by way int of introduction, if Mr. Good has my presentation up, please. Um, the Arlington Recycling Committee, in conjunction with the DPW uh, and with the support of town meeting through enactment of several uh, modifications of the bylaws over the last six to eight years, has uh, been promoting recycling uh, and has saved this town. Uh, our mutual efforts have saved this town over $1.5 million during that time uh, over, the, what, over what the usual um, uh, amounts we were paying. One of the ways that we've uh, done this is by implementing the Community Collection Day. Our next one will be on Saturday, May 12th at the yard from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. We, we strongly ask people to only come during those hours because before 9 o'clock, we're really not ready, and after 1 o'clock, the DPW staff rightly should be um, on setting up to go home. So what can you bring? Next slide. You can bring uh, uh, your CRTs and TVs. Normally, if you have that uh, t picked up on the curb at home, it costs you 20 bucks. If you drop it off on Saturday, it's only $10. Uh, additional details can be found from the DPW. You have an old propane tank. Uh, up to 20 pounds, you can drop it off for free. 
Next, please. Um, uh, a wonderful uh, group comes each year uh, and provides free paper shredding of confidential papers for residents, two boxes per resident, five bucks for every box thereafter, and businesses pay for all shredding. There is in the yard, and there is in the yard in the yard 24-7, uh, a paper collection bin, so you can always drop uh, papers off those. Uh, proceeds from that from Abitibi go to the Arlington Schools Foundation. Um, we ask you to not bring any cardboard on Saturday. Cardboard goes in your curbside single stream collection. Next, please. As I've noted previous, in previous years, um, we have a wonderful relationship with Bike Not Bombs. You can bring down clean, usable bikes. Uh, they ask for a $10 donation. Those are shipped off uh, to inner cities and third world countries. In the third world countries, they often become a family's sole means of transportation. The Board of Health uh, has added, um, participates in the last couple of years. They collect old prescriptions and syringes. That's a quite a popular service. Next, please. Uh, clean clothing, working toys, and shoes are collected. Those benefit the little fox for the, uh, the children and big brothers and big sisters. As you can see, there's a pattern here. Not only are we taking things out of the waste stream, whenever possible, we're trying to benefit someone in town uh, through our efforts. Books, DVDs, and CDs, sorry, LPs are no longer collected. Um, those are collected by the, Strat, uh, the Stratton and the little fox that helps them raise some money. Next, please. Um, uh, Dan Warren at the DPW suggested that they start collecting uh, metal uh, a couple years ago. It's been a big, uh, a big hit, and we thank him for suggesting that. So we, you can bring old pipes, poles, shelves, cabinets, swing sets, other metal things for recycling, but not appliances. This is not a workaround for the white goods collection, which you still have to do on a curbside collection with a permit. Um, you'll notice on the back, as I mentioned earlier, there's a long list, and this list is available online for those listening at home, of uh, the e-waste. Um, anything but the CRTs and television sets um, are free. Basically, pretty much, if it has a plug in it, you can bring it down. Uh, and again, you can also do that during regular hours at the DPW. Next, please. Uh, the environmental group at the high school has for many years, and it will again this year, um, under the mentorship of Nigel Krauss, be collecting returnable cans. Uh, they use the funds they raise here, or several hundred dollars, both in the spring and the fall, to promote recycling and environmental issues uh, worldwide. Batteries, car batteries, computer batteries, camera batteries. So anything that's rechargeable, or is that those penny or nick coin-like batteries, those all need to be um, recycled. Alkaline batteries can now go in the regular trash, so you don't have to do that. But those are collected by um, a battery recycling company for us for free. And you can pick up information on recycling. And last, um, we thank you again for your cooperation in the past and participation in helping to promote recycling in town, uh, saving us money, and uh, hope to see you Saturday at the Community Collection Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. announced tonight that uh, during the break the uh, Arlington High School girls tennis team will be selling baked goods coffee and cold drinks and uh, they drove all the way out to Wilmington today only to have their match canceled so they're, they're ready to keep busy this evening thank you any other announcements or resolutions oh this guy first you yep Thank you, Mr. Moderator. You're welcome. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I am also the events coordinator for the Friends of Robbins Farm Park. And I just wanted to uh, bring some attention to a special event we're holding this Saturday, the 12th at 4 p.m. Um, we are celebrating the return of our beloved hill slides. Um, for those of you who don't know Robbins Farm, we're up on the hill next to the big water tower. Um, we have a pair of 50 foot long hill slides that are a favorite among children in our neighborhood and Eastern Massachusetts. Um, I have had many occasion of talking with people who come up from deep on the South Shore, up on the North Shore who come to use our slides. Um, unfortunately, a year ago, January, something very large rolled through the bottom of it. And uh, it unfortunately was shut down and it was shut down for most of the spring and summer. Um, it was not an expense that the town was expecting. It was not an expense that the friends were expecting. 
but uh, working with uh, with Joe Connolly and with the um, the Parks and Recreation Commission, we were able to come up with a program where if the town could manage to raise through the capital budget half the price to replace the slides, that we would come up with the other half. Um, the total cost was $50,000, so we had we volunteered to raise $25,000. We did a large campaign uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we managed to raise over $32,000 as a, as a part of this, and as such, the slides were repaired and opened um, at the beginning of November. And we had anticipated a nice, normal New England winter and so had put off our opening celebration until the weather turned nice, which apparently was February, but <laughs> now it's May. <laughs> so, what we're, so we're having a... Um, we're having a little celebration. Uh, so it's this Saturday at 4 p.m. And we really, we, we want to thank everyone who took part. We want to thank all the families who contributed money. We want to especially thank a lot of children um, put a special effort into this. Um, kids held bake sales. They held craft sales. There were kids who collected money at their birthday parties. Uh, there were Girl Scout troops who, saved, who collected money. And so all of this came together. It was really a, a, a tremendous effort. And uh, we especially want to thank the the assistance and uh, the leadership coming from the Recreation Department and the Parks and Recreation Commission. So thank you all, and we hope you can join us. Thank you, Mr. Klein. <clears throat> Mark Kepline, Precinct 7. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday morning, I called 911, and um, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, safety professionals who work in this town. There was a woman who was lying in front of my neighbor's front lawn, and um, she was uh, she was conscious but not too oriented. Um, I called 911. The dispatcher answered right away, asked a couple of questions, and within a minute, Officer Mike Hogan was right there and started uh, assessing her. And then within the next two minutes, Arlington Fire and Rescue and Armstrong uh, ALS were there. And so uh, I think we're really blessed in this town to have such great safety professionals. <laughs> Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, do we have any reports or committees? Do we have a committee report? Mr. Tosti, can you take three off the table? Come forward. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, Article 3 is off the table. Walter Phillips, Precinct 21. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just wanted to uh, give a very brief uh, report of a tree committee. This town meeting had a tree committee from 2004 to 2010, and then we dissolved that committee, but the selectmen appointed a new committee, and this committee, um, we've been fairly active and uh, been responsible for planting trees, working with the town on some issues. We have a website, so if anybody is interested in what we've been doing or Looking for information about trees, we have a lot of information and a lot of references. Just look at our website. It's arlingtontrees.org. Thank you. Any other reports or committees? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti. Oh, you got a report? Sorry, Jane. Come forward. I'm distracted up here tonight. Settled. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Jane Howard, uh, Precinct 10, and uh, co-chair of the Vision 2020 Standing Committee. And I guess today, uh, many of you probably saw our report online. Uh, however, I would like to recommend that you, if you haven't seen it online, that there is a copy in the back of the hall and also a copy of the original survey. So. The committee would like me to tell you a little bit about this, and we are very, very pleased to report about the projects and activities that we performed in 2011, and also about a couple of things that have happened in 2012. 
So we first appear in the town's annual report in the community development section on pages 103 to 117. And that gives a little history about Vision 2020 and our projects for the year, as well as a report of last year's survey. That was called Truth or Consequences. You can influence the difficult decisions. The second part of our report is by reference to the Finance Committee's report for this annual town meeting and Article 51. And you gave favorable, in fact, unanimous vote to water bodies uh, funding again, this time for $50,000. The third is a summary of the, and is in the report in the back of the, of the hall. It's a summary of almost 4,400 household responses that we received in six weeks by May uh, March 15th of this year. And the name of that survey was Mastering Our Future, Help Arlington Prepare for Its Upcoming Master Planning Process. 24%, actually a little more than 24%, responded in just those six weeks. 3,698 on the paper form and 693 online. This is the third year in a row that more than 4,000 responses have been received. And the demographics page, which is essentially page two of this report, will show you that uh, responses came from all over town. Focused on preparing residents for the town's anticipated master planning process, the survey introduced Arlington to some trends and since 1990 and ask to have you look at some elephants that might help Arlington's future. And these responses that we, we got contribute, will probably contribute to the town's development, certainly, of the master plan. Residents were queried about <coughs> transportation systems, land use, town character, parking, housing, facilities, infrastructure, economic development, and financial sustainability. For each area, results are collected, and they're, they're displayed numerically by percent, total valid response, and the number of blanks. I ask you, as you review these pages, because I know you've just gotten them, notice that each question, one through seven, has ask for positive or negative responses, but with various gradations. And the value, for instance, varies in many, many shades. So it might be importance uh, to you, but also uh, you might just say that, well, perhaps it's somewhat important, or I offer some support, or I'm somewhat neutral and do, do pay attention to the numbers as they occur in those columns. For instance, in question one, safe neighborhoods, although it was way down in the list, emerged at the top of the list on both online and on the, uh, the paper surveys. And the results that you see are as a result of the merge of both those entities. Other issues that might be important or that I would like you to notice is that issues that we met during this town meeting, like mixed use you know, of retail office and residential, as well as accessory apartments, re receive strong support, but in several gradations in this report. We also learned in question seven that reduced services was not really favored as a way to achieve financial stability. Though this is not considered by some as a, a, t a scientific survey, and it certainly isn't, we met, this committee met for several months to develop the survey and its questions so that it would create awareness about among the residents for the master planning process and have value to the town as it prepares to involve, involve town's pe people starting in October. Residents were also encouraged in the survey to share their visions of Arlington's future for 10 or 20 years, and we have several essays on that uh, subject. 
we also have almost a thousand comments on items that came up in the survey. So, a summary of those comments and the vision statements has been collected and will follow this report. And the survey results already online and in the back of the room, as well as further analysis, especially by demographic areas, um, will follow as well. And they, they'll all be available on the town's website. I'd just like to share a little factoid. We learned that of the respondents, 621, or 14%, own or rent commercial spaces in Arlington. We've always thought of Arlington as having a lot of land, uh, absentee landlords, but that uh, contributes to maybe a new understanding of this. So in, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank the respondents, all 4,400 of them, plus the 115 that we've got at, in addition the committee that put this survey together, but especially the staff in the town clerk's office who opened and sorted all this paper return. Because as you know, this is a piggyback mailing. We put this survey in of rather limited size into the mailing with the annual town census at no extra cost because we don't, we, we trim it, <laughs> and uh, they open and sort every single one of those almost 3,700 paper responses. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Howard. <laughs> thank you, Vision 2020 Committee. <coughs> okay, any other reports of committees? On the point of reports of committees in the Warrant and under Article 3, there's one committee that we disbanded last year, but they have a new one. It's the Maintenance Study Committee of May 1, 2000. We disbanded that during last year's meeting, but I understand there's a new one formed under the Capital Budget Authority. They formed a new one. If any committees haven't reported or don't meet anymore, feel free to disband them next year. We have about 50 committees, um, and they don't meet and they don't do anything. We should just go ahead and disband them or get rid of them. Make it easier for Marie and the staff to keep track of. Mr. Tosti. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 3 is upon the table. I'm declaring the annual town meeting into recess, and we're going right back into Article 10 of the special. Recognize Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the special town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 14, 2012, at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, so moved. Um, Mr. Smith, did you want to introduce your article? Okay, do you have anything else to say to it? Oh, you did, all right. And we have one more. Um, Mr. Kaplan? You all remember Mr. Smith's from the other day? You should have it. Mr. Kaplan, you're up. I, uh, th thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Kaplan, uh, Precinct 6. Uh, as, I guess uh, as we were talking about two days ago, uh, this is Article 10, uh, putting a time limit on how long you can leave trash outside your house after trash pickup. Um, so just for, we're, we're back there. Um, I guess, well, first, um, the article right now is a, it's a solution to a problem that doesn't really exist yet. Uh, there's a concern that it will exist, you know, under our new trash pickup rules where people will not necessarily have all their trash picked up. Uh, there's a concern that they'll leave it on the curb. So um, right now, it's, it's a, there's no real guarantee that we're going to have a problem, but but it's sort of in case there is a problem, this is sort of our backup plan. We can find people if they leave trash on the curb. Um, I guess my, uh, my uh, proposed amendment, which, which is up there, um, I, I just add a few words. Uh, instead of uh, under the, the current plan, it's uh, the trash has to be brought back into the house or the yard uh, by 9 p.m. the night of trash pickup. 
uh, uh, my proposal is to make it 9 p.m. Um, of the next night, which, uh, which gives you, you know, a little more than a day to get the trash back in the house. Uh, I, I should point out that, uh, I mean, right now there's, there's no law requiring us to bring our trash barrels in after trash is picked up. Uh, in my neighborhood, you know, they're all gone back into the houses, you know, by 8 or 9 p.m. that night anyway. Uh, so th there's no, as, as from, in my neighborhood at least, there's no real reason to believe that this is going to cause a problem, that, that people probably won't be leaving trash lying around. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just in case, uh, it, it's not a bad idea to have a law that will cover us, you know, in case everyone starts leaving their trash lying around. Um, so my suggestion is just to delay it a little bit, uh, give people a little bit more time. And, uh, I mean, it, there are a few reasons for that. I, I think it was pointed out uh, last session that, you know, sometimes waste management forgets to pick up trash and you call and they say, leave it out, we'll pick it up tomorrow. Um, so there's another amendment that, uh, that suggests that, you know, you can leave it out and if you called waste management and it's confirmed, then you don't get fined, you have another day. Uh, that, that seems, it's a little complicated. It is very easy to enforce if you say, you know, uh, at this time, any trash on the street is in violation, that's easy. It's a little harder to say at this time any trash is in violation unless we call waste management and they tell us it's not, uh, possibly going through different levels. So, so this is, I guess, one goal is just to simplify that process. Uh, if you have to leave your trash out an extra day to get it picked up, you're not going to get fined. Um, and, and the second reason is, I think was also pointed out is that, uh, you know, we're not always home by, by 9 o'clock. Uh, I know with town meetings sometimes, some people go, they, you know, they're at work, they have dinner, they rush to town meeting, they don't go home. I should point out that if your trash collection day is, is a Monday or a Wednesday and you rush to town meeting uh, but without going home, then you would in the future be in violation because you left your trash out uh, on the curb, you know, until 11 when you get home from town meeting. So, so those are the, the two, I guess, the two main issues to address. Uh, and I do think it's a good idea to have something in place where if, you know, the, somebody's leaving his trash out all the time, you know, you can complain and there's actually a law that, that you know, the, the town can come and find somebody and presumably that will get them to bring the trash in. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the, I guess that's the point of this article. Uh, the amendment is, uh, it would be 9 p.m. the night after trash pickup. So if your trash pickup is Monday, which is my trash pickup, uh, I have until 9 p.m. on Tuesday uh, to get my trash back in uh, in case there should be trash lying around. Um, and I should just point out, also that, you know, as things stand, uh, it's very unlikely that, you know, my trash pickup day is Monday. I don't think that the police are going to be out ticketing people at 9.15 p.m. on Monday. Uh, I think that's very unlikely. In fact, as with, with most enforcement in town, it will probably be spotty at best. So um, giving people an extra day I don't think is going to matter much because I doubt in the first day most people will get fined anyway. Uh, so why create a law that we're not even going to enforce? Uh, this way, sort of after a day and a half, people are probably in gross violation and maybe uh, they'll be more likely to be fined. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's the, the basic gist of, of this uh, amendment to the article. And um, this is also, I guess, since this article has also been used to sort of introduce the uh, proposed new trash and waste pickup policies, um, I, I just wanted to, I, I, there's a slide that, that may or may not make it on the screen. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the last few years, um, the, the last day of leaf pickup uh, is usually a week or two before the day that leaves actually stop falling. And uh, that, that's, that's my, my backyard upside down about a week after the last, the last trash uh, leaf pickup. And as you can see, there's leaves all over the lawn. It was, it was spotless, you know, the, my pickup is Monday, Sunday afternoon, there were no leaves on there. Uh, this is roughly a week later, those leaves were there all winter. Uh, actually, there were more. That was only about, you know, but uh, maybe, maybe we are having global warming or maybe our dates are just off. But uh, while we're negotiating these contracts, it might be good to get another week or two of leaf pickup in there so that, uh, you know, we're not stuck storing leaves for, a week, for the, you know, the entire winter. Uh, anyway, th thanks very much. Thank you. If, if you were on the list the other day, you're still on the list, so you don't have to raise your hand again. Mr. Deist? Mr. Fisher? I, I support this. I think it has the right touch. It's not a harsh penalty kind of situation. Um, we have a bylaw that says 
asks people not to put their trash out uh, before 6 p.m., before the day, and I've never heard a complaint about the way that's enforced. I think people just do it, so I, I like this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Ms. Norton. Emily Norton, Precinct 6. I move the question. What is the? A motion to terminate debate motion in to all terminate matters before the article. The debate in all manners, matters before the article. Second. Okay. We have a motion to terminate debate on the, on the article in all matters. All, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion is a two third vote. Madam. Uh, they, I don't think they've talked about the fine yet. It's not in this. That's, that'll be up to the... I don't know who's going to make the fine. Ms. Rice? Ms. Rice is going to tell you how much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Uh, Title IX of the Town Bylaws, um, Section 2, provide that unless a specific fine for a specific section of the bylaw is provided, that uh, any violation shall be um, assessed a fine not exceeding twenty dollars. So that would apply in this instance. So it's twenty bucks if you leave your barrels out. No, no, per incident. Do, Mr. Greeley, what matter do you rise? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and, and I'm not sure, I just want to clear with you, I'd like to just clarify a point that was made related to this article that was a misconception. Um, they've terminated, was said? they've terminated the debate already, Mr. Greeley. Okay, it was, but people are about to vote on it. They, they've terminated the debate, I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right, we have before us two, artic two amendments. One is Mr. Smith's, which was on your chair the other day, and the other is Mr. Kaplan's. Mr. Smith wants to add the words at the beginning of the sentence, unless it can be reasonably expected that pickup will occur on the following day. Now, Mr. Kaplan wants to add the words, 9 p.m. of the first day after. I would suggest that they're the same, almost, but you wouldn't want to vote for both. So choose which language you like better and vote for that one. Um, I, I, Voting for both would just make it a really messy bylaw. So first we're going to vote on Mr. First we're going to vote on Mr. Smith's because he was first in order. Mr. Sir. Uh, also, uh, oh, they could pass. We just have a messy bylaw. You guys can do what you want. I'm just going to make sure you do it right. You get to do what you want. I'm just making a suggestion. Mr. Smith. Unless you're going to withdraw yours. No, you can say you don't like it anymore, and then I well, can say I, vote I, it down. I, I like Mr. Kaplan's. He does a fewer words than I did. Scott, oh, Scott Smith, Precinct 5. Uh, maybe just a suggestion. Maybe vote Mr. Kaplan's first, and then I think mine would be moot if that passes. Well, they can vote yours yeah, down and vote yeah. Mr. Kaplan's if you like his better. <laughs> now, we're going to vote on Mr. Smith. So all in favor of Mr. Smith's, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay, Mr. Smith's is a negative vote. Now we have Mr. Kaplan's adding those four elegant words. All in favor of Mr. Kaplan's, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion is a positive vote. All right, five people arose. All in favor of Mr. Smith's, please, uh, Mr. Kaplan's amendment, please rise. Mr. Dunn? Eight. Eight up front. Mr. Schlickman? Twenty six. Twenty six on my left. <laughs> Mr. Trembley? 
36 in the right center. And Mr. Uh, McCabe? 23 on the right. Mr. Um, O'Connor? 44. All opposed, please rise. Mr. Dunn? One. One. Mr. Schlickman? Eleven. Eleven. Mr. O'Connor? Four. 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 Mr. Trembley? Eight. Eight. And Mr. McCabe? Sixteen. Well, it's 137 in the positive, 40 in the negative. Huh, got it right. <laughs> All right, we have now before us the um, recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as amended by Mr. Kaplan. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that's a positive vote. Yeah, all right, let's vote again. All of, uh, everybody who wants it, rise. All in favor, please raise. Same counters. You think so? Nine up front. Mr. Schlickman? 23. 23. Mr. O'Connor? 38. 38. Mr. Trembley? 33. 33. Mr. McCabe? 33. 3 3? 3 0. 30. All, all opposed, please rise. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn is asleep for real, but zero. 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 Mr. Dunn didn't do his job right. I did, and I apologize for his job. Okay. Rico. I apologize, Charles. <laughs> How One. many up front, Mr. Dunn? One. One. Mr. Schlickman. Fifteen. Fifteen. Mr. O'Connor? Eleven. Eleven. Mr. Trembley? 11. 11. Mr. McCabe? 10. 10. It's a positive vote, 133 in the positive, 48 in the negative. Doesn't need two thirds. It's not a um, zoning bylaw. It's one third, or excuse me, it's a ma majority vote. All right, Mr. Tosti. Mr. Moderator, I move that Article One be taken from the table. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, Article One is upon the table. Mr. Uh, Moderator. Yep. I move that we take up. Uh, and do the fact that the superintendent... Wait, wait, we have to get rid of article. I have to adjourn the meeting first. Okay, sorry. I move that the town meeting be dissolved. The special, the special town meeting. Special town meeting. <laughs> Darn, almost did that. <laughs>
All right, all in favor of adjourning a special town meeting of 2012, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? I move the meeting so, so dissolved. That brings us back into the regular town meeting. Mr. Moderator? Uh, yes, sir. In regards that the superintendent of Minuteman is here, uh, I move that we take up articles 44, 45, and 46. All in favor of taking up 44, 45, and 46, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Okay, Article 44 is before us. Mr. Moderator, uh, actually 44 is uh, uh, introduced Mr. Biller for chairman of the uh, retirement board. Yeah, um, Mary Ellen Billifer, please. Mary Ellen Billifer, Precinct 11. Yeah, Mr. Lewis. Moderator, I did have um, a substitute motion that I left for you, and it was also on the chairs on Monday. And that I would like to um, ask the meeting that the chairman of the retirement board, John Billifer, speak to the article and the, um, the and substitute, the substitute motion. motion. Do we have a second on her substitute? Second. Mr. Billifer? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Billifer. They're not related. <laughs> yes, they are. I know they are. I'm joking, yeah. Did you get hers? Yes, it is. Good evening. I'm John Billifer, Chairman of the Arlington Retirement Board. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this matter involving a court judgment against the Arlington Retirement Board in the amount of $785,000. Please allow me to describe the circumstances leading to this judgment. When the Minuteman Vocational School District was established in 1973, the administration of retirement matters for all non-teaching Minuteman personnel was arbitrarily assigned to the Arlington Retirement Board. I believe this assignment took place because Arlington was the largest community in the newly formed vocational school district. Arlington administered Minuteman's retirement matters for 10 years, at which time Minuteman petitioned and was granted permission from the state legislature to establish a standalone retirement system, despite the relatively small number of non-teaching employees involved. It should be pointed out that at no time during this 10-year period was there any suggestion that Minuteman was establishing its own retirement program because of any failure of performance on Arlington's part. As a result of the petition, all Minuteman employee pension deductions and interest in the amount of $286,000 were then transferred by Arlington to the newly established retirement system. Now, during the 10-year period, the employer, Minuteman, paid Arlington approximately $70,000 a year, and we could speculate that was probably for the cost of administering their uh, pension system. These payments were never re requested to be returned by Minuteman, nor would they be offered to be returned by Arlington. Now, at this point, I ask you, to keep in mind that this all happened in 1983. Arlington was not under a, uh, or the Commonwealth, none of the retirement systems were under a funded pension system. It was a pay-as-you-go system. Our retirement administrator at that time, and I could speculate this, treated it as a, as a strictly administrative matter. She was asked to transfer the employee contributions. She did, she wasn't asked to do anything else so she did nothing further. Arlington believed, therefore, that by establishing its own retirement system and receiving all of its employee retirement contributions, Minuteman was starting from scratch as a new system. However, some 20 years later, Minuteman became, began billing Arlington for the 10 years that Minuteman employees had spent affiliated with the Arlington retirement system. Now, it is common practice among Massachusetts retirement boards to either bill or be billed for that portion of a retirement allowance for the time spent by retirees in each Massachusetts community during their working years. These financial transfers occur among retirement systems on an annual basis. 
However, the Arlington Retirement Board voted to appeal this matter to the courts because it didn't believe that this financial transfer arrangement applied to a regional vocational school district that had broken off from an affiliated arrangement in order to establish its own standalone retirement system. And furthermore, if the court found that there was retirement liability for the first 10 years of Minuteman's existence, Arlington felt that re liability should be shared among all of the 16 towns in the vocational school district. Why should Arlington be saddled with this entire liability when Minuteman retirement matters had been arbitrarily assigned to the town as part of the original school district agreement. Unfortunately, the court did not see it our way and assessed Arlington $785,000, the entire liability for 10 years of retirement for 13 Minuteman employees from the date of their retirements to the present, with a continuing annual liability in the estimated amount of $41,000 until all these retirees and their spouses have deceased. By voting no action on the original Warren article, the Finance Committee recommends that the Retirement Board pay this judgment out of its own funds. This is a bit misleading, however, and I'd like to clear that up because the appropriation you vote for retirement under Budget 23 can be divided into two categories. First, an amount used for the actual administration of Arlington's retirement operation on behalf of our employees and retirees, and second, an amount determined by our actuary to fully fund Arlington's pension liabilities until no later than 2040. The Retirement Board has no other available funds. A one-time payment of this liability, as originally suggested by the Finance Committee, would disrupt our funding schedule and cause our actuary to deal with this $785,000 judgment either as a one-time liability or by amortizing or paying it off over a period of years at an estimated cost of $100,000, $150,000 for each of these options. The Retirement Board possesses no leverage over Minuteman with regard to this judgment. However, both the Finance Committee and this town meeting possess significant leverage over the vocational school district. And this is why we have presented this substitute motion which asks this body to recommend that the Minuteman Retirement Board allow Arlington to pay this judgment without interest over a 10 year period. It will save Arlington, as I mentioned, $100,000 to $150,000 and will have little or no adverse effect on Minuteman. Whereas Arlington's unfunded pension liability is close to 50% Minuteman is probably the highest funded pension system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at 104% funding. A one-time payment of $785,000 would only serve to further increase Minuteman's overfunded pension status. An installment payment plan is therefore a more sensible option for both Arlington and Minuteman. Therefore, the Retirement Board requests your support of this substitute notion, motion. Please know that the Finance Committee also supports this motion, and I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tosti? When the Retirement Board uh, came to us with this article, uh, we listened to it all, uh, did some research, uh, and while we were not happy, uh, that we had to pay back all of this money because in effect I think the court suit went too far the other way. Uh, it was a court liability, uh, it was a, a court judgment that we can't do anything about. Uh, it is the retirement board's liability and therefore that was the reason for our original vote of, of no action. We also didn't want to hit the general fund for like $800,000. Uh, but eventually, and keep this in mind, this will be a liability to the town over a period of time. Uh, Mr. Billifer returned to us uh, earlier this week on, on Monday and offered this substitute motion that is before you. Uh, the Finance Committee discussed this and unanimously voted to support uh, Mr. Billifer's substitute motion. Uh, we hope that Minuteman will listen to this vote and give it due consideration. 
uh, I think, from its largest member. Now, just keep a couple of things in mind. There's nothing we can do about the court judgment. It is a court judgment. We will own the money. What we're asking Minuteman to do is to consider to pay it over a 10-year period of, of time. And so I hope you su uh, support the substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tosti. Mr. Um, Tully? Um, a couple questions, if you can maybe um, review some of the facts behind this. I understood Mr. Billifer to say that we paid 200 something thousand dollars to Minuteman or to their pension at the outset of the, the, the facts that led to this litigation. And Mr. Billifer, can, can, can you he's got a what? question for you, asking how much money I, you paid, paid to Minuteman at the beginning of the litigation. Yeah. Is that it, Joe? I'm having trouble understanding what the 700,000 represents. You indicated that there was 200 something thousand that was paid to them at the beginning of this fiasco. Uh, the $285,000 was, was uh, the employee contributions uh, during that 10-year period. Uh, those go into a separate account, Joe, uh, that it's called the annuity portion of a retiree's pension. So they had to be sent over to Miniman to continue that, uh, that account basis. That was the 200000 285000 Okay, and so what is the judgment? What's the 700-something thousand judgment? What does that represent? That, that represents uh, uh, what, what the court did, I think, was apply uh, the, the law as it exists between uh, individual retirement systems that I explained, uh, that transfer type law. Uh, if you serve 10 years in, in Arlington and you go to Wilmington and serve 20 years and retire, Arlington owes each year Wilmington and okay. send them uh, 10 years worth of, of uh, that okay. retiree's retirement. Now what the court did was uh, rather than considering in our and our attorney argued this, but unsuccessfully, rather than considering uh, that this was a vocational school district, they treated it like an individual community and applied the same law. There's no other law on the books. Uh, I have to say the court, there was no other law that they, uh, they could apply because there's nothing that deals strictly with, with vocational school districts that have a number of members. Okay, thank you. And. Uh, it's probably a moot point at this at this point, but w was this a superior court case? Uh, yes. This, sorry, and we decided we didn't want to. It was appeal appeals court case. I'm sorry. Okay, so we lost at the appeals level. Yeah. Okay. And and our attorney recommended that on the basis of what the appeals court said that there was uh, there was no sense to appeal it okay. any further. Uh, would you suggest that in terms of wanting to spread out this liability over a period of years that where we have a little more leverage vis-a-vis -vis Minuteman, their willingness to accept sort of payments over time as opposed to lump sum if we go ahead and uh, act favorably on this motion? We think that if you act favorably on this motion, that it will go, hopefully go strongly to admin uh, you know, allowing us to pay it over a period of years. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jamison. Go away. Um, Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, if, if I'm correct, the uh, Retirement Board um, shares responsibilities not only for um, uh, town, town of Arlington and certain school employees that are uh, under its auspices, but um, also the Arlington Housing um, Authority. Um, and Mr. Billifer is nodding an affirmative. Uh, my question is, uh, was that relationship um, in place between 1973 and 1983? Yes, it was, Mr. Jameson. So uh, my question through the moderator to you, Mr. Billifer, is uh, uh, shouldn't the Housing Authority be picking up part of this cost? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking. Uh, why, I'm looking for, uh, wh for an why answer. Why not? For the why not? They were they were in the kettle with everybody else, and part of the kettle, part of the the people walked away. Well, and, well, and so the, the remaining part of the, you know. Well, uh, I think the answer to that, and I'll let my retirement administrator clarify it if I give the wrong answer. 
the Arlington Housing Authority is affiliated with Arlington as a separate unit. In other words, uh, uh, they, don't, uh, uh, they don't share a liability like this, and uh, uh, you know that wouldn't be the case. Similarly, if Minuteman had stayed in the Arlington system, uh, like the Arlington Housing Authority, uh, you know, this never would have happened. Uh, of course, it never would have come to pass. Okay, and um, just one last clarification. Uh, looking forward to the budgets when we uh, vote favorably on your request to the uh, town under article, I forget which, when it's in the 20s. 23. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, there's a separate payment into the retirement board system every year from the housing authority uh, in addition to the monies we appropriate here on the floor of town meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Leonard. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. First, let me say that it is nice to see Mr. Villefer in the hall after such a long time. And by the way, he's still looking for you. Uh, a couple of questions, if I could, Mr. Moderator. Is it my understanding now that after Arlington was involved in this from 1973 to 1983 that we would, could not see another town coming across a similar situation? Not that it would involve Arlington, but another district involved with Minutemen wouldn't be taking another 10 years down the road, or does Minutemen have sole possession of this so-called dilemma right now? Uh, Mr. Billifer, if you can answer that. John, uh, in, in 1983, no, uh, you know, this issue wasn't, uh, wasn't on the table with any other uh, vocational school district. Subsequently, uh, when uh, just before Arlington went to, uh, went to court, or, I'm sorry, I strike that. After Arlington went to court, a number of other retirement systems uh, that were uh, under the same uh, problem uh, 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 decided not to go to court because uh, we had lost. But in answer to your question, at the time, in 1973 and 83, no, the issue was not apparent at all. We were under a pay-as-you-go system then, and the, uh, the thought processes that everybody had was that uh, this was just you know, a pay-as-you-go problem that uh, you just paid however many pensions, however much in pensions each year that, uh, uh, that would do, uh, and that was it. Uh, so there was no thought to, uh, if this issue came up now, uh, uh, the same issue of Minuteman getting out, uh, we would have uh, uh, spent a great deal more time with it because there would have been funding issues involved that weren't involved uh, in 1983 at all. Now, I, I guess maybe what I'm trying to say is that, not that it would pertain to Arlington so much, but could we possibly see something in the future from 1983 to 1993 that Minuteman might find themselves in a similar situation with the town of Lexington, with the town of Belmont, with the town of Watertown? No, no, because uh, what the court said uh, was that Arlington the retirement, Minuteman retirement system for 10 years resided in Arlington and it's Arlington's total liability. That's one of the things that we objected to. Uh, we thought all the other expenses of the vocational school district are distributed among the 16 towns on a, on a proportional basis and we thought that that same uh, um, uh, reasoning should apply uh, with, with this case. Uh, but the judge unfortunately disagreed with us. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, one or two other little points which seem kind of like a little aggravating to me is that we've, we in town meeting have, for the past couple of years have heard representatives from Minutemen come up and talk about how, as we all know, what a great institution it is, what fine work it does, but let's basically say how they were getting their house in order and et cetera. Uh, Mr. Totsi eloquently pointed out under the special town meeting, 
the emergency that came up with Article 4, which we all understood. In this particular situation, we see Minutemen and money factors involved again. <clears throat> totally different situation, I realize. But as we look further on down the road, Articles 45 and Article 46, in one way or another, I again basically saying, could Arlington come across with some money for Minutemen? I'm kind of puzzled that even though they're all only connected by under the, the roof of Minutemen, that all of a sudden it seems like Minutemen indirectly is in dire straits and needs money after we've been told the past couple of years that things were looking pretty good. I wonder if somebody could speak to that, or should we wait to the administrators for Minutemen speak? I won't comment on that. <laughs> under his, we'll address that under the budget when the administrator's here. We can question him with those questions at that point. Okay, thank I'll you, Mr. I'll continue to go on the list for that. Mr. O'Brien. Andy O'Brien, Precinct 16. Um, I'm just curious to know if um, an interest rate was factored into the $700 plus thousand dollar number, and if we do break this up into individual payments, uh, are we going to be charged interest? And if so, did we look into maybe raising a bond or something like that that might, we might pay less of an interest on? There's probably some sort of interest built into the judgment. Is that correct, Mr. Billifer? And what, under this resolution, we're asking them to waive interest on the 10 years. I would say the interest was built into the judgment as of uh, uh, the date of the judgment. And uh, the next day after we received the judgment, uh, the Minuteman Retirement Administrator called us and asked Mr. Greco when we were going to pay it. Uh, and we indicated to him at the time that we needed time to, uh, to uh, bring this to town meeting. In answer to your question, Mr. O'Brien, uh, part of the article is uh, to avoid the interest, and we're hoping uh, that, uh, that Minuteman will do that. Thank you very much. Mr. McCabe, ready to go over there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I move to terminate all debate under Article 44 and all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 44 and all matters. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. My opinion, debate is terminated. <clears throat> we have before us the substitute motion of Ms. Billifer requesting that Minuteman stretch out our payment scheme over 10 years without interest in equal installments. So, all in, oh wait, there's one administrative change. In the second line up, they have the docket number wrong. It should be case number 2008P1491. So if you'll just add a one at the end of that docket number. Otherwise, it's fine. All in favor of Mr. Mc, um, Billifer's amended substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Oh. My opinion, it is a positive vote. Positive, and that disposes of Article 44. Oh, wait a second. Why? He said no. I said, any opposed? And someone said no. Oh, we substituted. Sorry. All in favor of the substitute vote, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. That disposes of Article 44 and brings us to Article 45, Appropriation, Minimum and Regional Vocational Technical High School. We have the recommended vote of the FinCom. Um, Mr. Foskett, or, oh, Mr., yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Steve DeCourcy, Precinct 2, and also a member of the Finance Committee. Um, the recommended vote under Article 45 is an appropriation of three million oh twenty two one forty six um, tonight we, we do have the superintendent of the Minuteman district dr. Edward Boquillen who will present the budget I just want to give a couple of um, discussion points before he speaks um, the, this is a significant increase over the appropriation from last year um, and, and the primary reason for that is that the Arlington the, the member district um, 
assessments are based on the number of district students as of the October 1 preceding each fiscal year. Uh, a year ago, we, we actually had the happy situation that the district enrollment, in-district enrollment had gone up. Arlington's number had stayed relatively flat. Uh, we had 115 full-time equivalent students, which was about 26% of the in-district um, figure. This year, we have 139 full-time equivalents, and that's about 32%. So we're a larger percentage uh, than we were a year ago. So there's a, a significant increase in the assessment to Arlington. Uh, Dr. Boquillen will present the budget for Minuteman, and, and by voting this appropriation in the affirmative, you're actually approving the Minuteman budget. Um, the overall budget for Minuteman has increased just under 5%, about 4.97%, uh, from 16.4 million to 17.2 million. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd first, before I uh, ask Dr. Boquillen to come up, I'd like to recognize Laura Marset who is Arlington's representative to the Minuteman School Committee, um, has been for a number of years and has rep represented the town ably on, on that school committee. Um, I also would like to ask Dr. Boquillen to come up um, and he will present the budget to you. Well, good evening. Um, that was an interesting discussion. I would have liked to have spoken to it during the motion, but I want to let you know that the incidents and the issues around the retirement system, I as superintendent will advocate for um, a reasonable approach to this. Uh, no one that I know of um, was directly involved in this situation, and it was something I learned about actually a few years into my superintendency. I'm beginning my sixth year at Minuteman. Um, so I will work with the town of Arlington and the two retirement boards because it's not part of our regional school district and it's not part of the town of Arlington. It's really the two retirement boards and I will work um, hard to make sure that we uh, try to accommodate the concerns that have been expressed here tonight in regards to this retirement uh, judgment. So I want you to know that, that I've had, um, that I'm committed to doing that with you. <clears throat> I believe I'll speak, I have nine minutes. You all have had copies of this at your table, so I'm not going to be reading slides. I'm going to go through it so we have time for questions and such. Um, we look at ourselves a little bit differently after we've done some focus group visits with parents and graduates and students. and um, We really believe that the Minuteman experience is very unique and different and valuable in this economy today. Uh, we have a rigorous and relevant curriculum. Um, I'm going to stand to the side if you don't mind. I don't have my... Uh, we, some people don't know. We have a rigorous reading program. We teach three world languages, a Collins writing program. Every student's required to submit a portfolio before they can graduate from Minuteman. We have art and music programs that are thriving. Um, we're using some technologies to communicate with parents. Our executive functioning initiative has been very successful and will continue in this budget and our library is an active part. Our graduates, 100% are passing MCAS, 98% um, passing it on the first try, and when you realize that 47% of our students are on an IEP, um, I'm pretty proud of the uh, performance of our kids. This is the overall budget for this year. Um, we can see there's a, about an $816,000 increase. Um, that increase um, is composed of contractual increases, we just signed a three-year contract with our teachers' union. This fiscal year that we're in now, 12, they had a 0% cost of living adjustment. In FY13, it's a 1%. In FY14, 2%. Health insurance increases, uh, we've been able to keep at a minimum. We are not part of the GIS. We're in a health trust with five other vocational schools. We have some other... Um, areas of increased Perkins grant funding allocation. Basically, we've had to move people off federal grants onto the budget. Um, we're going back to a dedicated principal position. I've eliminated six administrative positions over the last uh, five years, and I'm now sharing a principal with our community ed and adult ed, and we're going to go back to a dedicated principal position. 
We have some other uh, expenses that we really don't have much control over, fuel escalation, requests for uh, increases in supplies and materials based on an increase in enrollment. This is our historical budget over the last six years. We sort of reset in FY11. Um, our revenue plan, you can see we have about an increase of $400,000 in what we assess our 16 member towns. Our Chapter 78, we're looking at fairly level funded. Transportation reimbursement up a little bit. I want to point out uh, the current year, the tuition revenues here. There's been a lot of discussion amongst many of our uh, towns, all of our communities, about how many students come to Minuteman from outside of the district. We're collecting about $4.5 million of tuition, and we're using that in our revenue plan. Other uh, areas of our revenue plan are fairly stable. Uh, that's another look at what we're projecting in terms of revenue that we'll be using towards the uh, offsetting assessments for member towns. When you look at the actual dollars we spend on salary over the last five years, this tells the tale a little bit better than anything um, I could tell you. We're spending about $9.6 million in, to, in actual dollars of salary next year. This is lower than it was five years ago. Overall, I've reduced the staffing at Minuteman by over 35 professional staff. At the same time, our enrollment has come up. So when you talk about, and there was mentioned before, of Minuteman getting its financial house in order, we're running a very lean operation. Our staffing, as you can see, our per pupil expenditures, we have a moderate increase next year. When you compare us to other um, types of education, uh, regional vocational technical high school foundation budgets, which just is really a way to compare, is just slightly above the average. When you look at um, other regional vocational technical schools, you can see Minuteman is about 15,100 per pupil, and you, we are not the highest any longer in that measure. When you look at our district and how much is spent above foundation, you can see Minuteman over in the far left. Um, all of our other member towns, for the most part, are spending above foundation. So when we're questioned about the expense, we're really just investing in education at a similar rate that our district does. Enrollment increases. Enrollment is, I think, uh, one of our most important issues that we have to deal with. You can see our member freshman rate has increased about 8% over last year. Our non-member rate up about 7%. Overall, we're having freshman classes of around 200, which is the highest it's been in the last 10 years. Our, non -member, our member enrollment is about the same. We're trying very hard to increase that. Non-member enrollment, even after we increased our non-member tuition to the maximum rate, we thought by charging the maximum we'd have a lower um, application rate. It went up 10%. Our postgraduate students, which we're now charging a tuition to people from Arlington that want to come as postgraduates, it may have had an impact on our enrollment, so we're looking at that very closely. But our overall enrollment is about 780 um, headcount, about 700 and, uh, 785 headcount, up about 4% from last year. Here's another look at enrollment over the last few years. Um, the, in, as Steve mentioned, Arlington had an increase in enrollment this year, which was the major factor increasing the assessment. Uh, and this just looks at the special ed uh, population at Minuteman compared to other vocational schools. And the special ed enrollment in our districts, which averages about 15%. So Minuteman is about three times the number of IEP students in our care than on the average throughout our member towns. And then when you look from town to town, um, you can see how different towns tend to look at us as an out-of-district placement for special ed. Um, Arlington, um, about 37% of the students are on IEP, below the average. Here's the Arlington assessment, and you can see for FY13, the overall assessment is up about $700,000, or 28%. Our per pupil cost is up from 17 for a high school uh, student not on an IP. It's up a little bit. Overall, we have a greater percentage than we've had in the past on IEPs. Um, and these numbers here do not include uh, transportation, nor do they include capital costs. Thank you.
Okay. Mr. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 8. And I rise to address you as uh, Charles Foskett of Precinct 8, proud town meeting member, not as a member of the Finance Committee or Capital Planning Committee. And I rise in objection to this budget. Now, um, actually, I'm not going to ask you to vote no action. I'm going to move a substitute motion uh, because Mr. Tosti convinced me that if I asked you to vote no action, it would actually cost the town more, and we don't want to do that. So my substitute motion is to change the Minuteman budget from $3,022,146,000 and reduce it by $700,000 to $2,322,146. By doing so, in practice, you won't be changing a thing at Minuteman because the Minuteman bu budget is essentially approved by all the other towns already, and your vote is meaningless. But by taking this action, you'll be sending a message to the Finance Committee and to the Board of Selectmen that we want the Minuteman Agreement changed. And let me take you into some of the details of that. Uh, oh, yeah, heavy heart. Okay, I wanted to make a couple of comments here. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I really like my fellow Finance Committee members, and I like the Board of Selectmen, and I value, the, uh, I value the Minuteman as an institution. But I can't not address this issue with a clear conscience. I have to bring it up, and I have to ask your support. My view of Minuteman is that it serves its students well, and Arlington is very fortunate to have this resource. And I think Dr. Boquillen is one of the best things to happen at Minuteman since I've been in town meeting. And I also think that the facilities there are in need of an upgrade, and it's likely to cost us a lot of money in the future. However, um, we have an agreement that we've been in for the last, I don't know, 35 years. And it's a disaster. It's kept us in fiscal bondage, and I'll show you that even tonight we're in fiscal bondage to this agreement. It offers Arlington no control over its funds at Minuteman and very little influence over the management of the Minuteman system. And it renders town meeting votes like this one virtually immaterial. And any of you who remember the Neswick Agreement of many years ago, this makes the, the Neswick Agreement look like child's play because we're in this for life. Let me just draw your attention to one fact about the fiscal year 13 operating budget. The increase is $816,240. And it's paid as shown on, on this slide. I extracted this from one of the uh, Minuteman, um, one of the Minuteman um, uh, presentation slides. And Arlington's increase is $728,326. If we take that increase and divide it by 20, 24, our, our increase in students, we're talking about paying $30,347 a year for those incremental 24 students. And this is unconscionable. And it's not only because of the increase in the number of students, it's because the Minuteman School Committee and the, and the management changed the accrual and allocation method so that our increase increased faster than the overall rate of increase of the, of the budget. So, in fact, of the $816,240 increase in the total budget this year, Arlington's paying 89.2% of it. And I submit that this did not have to happen. It happened because the school committee, the Minuteman School Committee voted it, and they did it because they can get away with it because we have no control over that committee through this agreement. Now, what's wrong here is that the membership in this agreement is skewed. Arlington submits, uh, provides about 30% or 35% of the students, but we have 1 16th of the voting power. We have no voting power proportional to our number of students or to the money that we spend. 
There are no incentives here for new towns to come into this agreement and p carry, carry more of the f funding because looming ahead of us is a capital expenditure there that's somewhere between 50 and 100 million dollars. The regional population in general is too small to support a school like this with the, with the current complexion of, of, uh, of, of town, cities and towns. And the district is dominated by small towns who send one or two students to the, to the district and don't really have any skin in the game. So we're carrying the, the biggest uh, financial burden. Now, this hasn't been addressed, but there is a proposed capital program which has essentially value in, in, because the school needs work. And it's probably going to cost between 50 and 100 million dollars. This is, these are figures that I extracted from prior Minuteman documents. Now, Minuteman plans to go ahead and borrow money for a 700, more than $700,000 feasibility study. Arlington can stop this now, but your Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee voted against doing that now. And they have a variety of reasons. They discussed it, it was debated, et cetera. But I submit to you that the time to stop it is now, not after the feasibility study. And there's reasons for that. Basically, let me, let me first of all say that, um, to make a couple more comments about the, about the school system here. Um, the, the, the superintendent talked about increasing enrollments, but the rate of increase in enrollments all comes from Arlington, not, not from other towns. If you take Arlington out of the equation, the enrollments from other cities and towns are, are dropping. We're looking at a large capital investment coming ahead, and, and we have an opportunity to exercise leverage by stopping the feasibility study on this capital improvement program in order to force the, the whole Minuteman community, by that I mean the membership member towns, to actually change the agreement in the direction that we need. Now what do we need? We need proportional voting. I think we need to have votes that are, a vote that's at least 50 percent weighted by the number of paying students provided by the town. I'm thinking of the Constitution. You know, you have a proportional House of Representatives, and you have one man. Uh, you have the, the Senate that's proportional to the to the uh, to the states. We need an equitable capital payment structure, because right now, half of the students there are from quote unquote non-member towns out of district. They do not pay for any capital improvements in the system. So we'll so we'll be we'll be paying their share of the capital improvements, and we're paying you know 30, 35 percent of that. And finally, we need an exit path, an exit, uh, or an exit method. And there is no way of getting out of this agreement right now. We're, we've been in it for 35 years. We can't get out of it. And we're going to be in it for the next century if we don't do something now. And I think an equitable, equitable change would be uh, some sort of a, a program where we could get out in five to seven years if the town made that decision, provided that it, it met its uh, current and ongoing financial obligations. Now, the reason why it's so important to act now and not later is because once the feasibility study is finished, we'll see a design. I mean, I've been in these programs, a design with beautiful pictures, you know, and we'll have a, a great idea for a school. I come up here and talk to you about these things all the time. And the state's going to dangle 50% reimbursement out there. And the building committee, of which a member of our capital planning committee is on the building committee, the building committee will have worked for two years tirelessly. And true, it will, they will have worked tirelessly, and they've done a great job. But all of these things, plus the, plus the mantra, think of the students and what they need, all of these things will create inexorable pressure on the town of Arlington not to stop the building program and not to get the agreement changed. And I don't think we want that as a town. So, the, and finally, I think there'll be pressure, quote unquote, not to displease the uh, Massachusetts School Building Administration because you know, we, we're going to want to rebuild a high school, we're going to want to do other things, and we're, we're going to need to be on their good side. The result's going to be that we'll, we'll wind up spending more money on a Minuteman than we've spent on the Thompson Elementary School. And I think our town leaders, and I include myself in that, and I include per, perhaps presumptuously you, presumptively you, and other, other town leaders, that we're, it's going to be very difficult for us to have the courage to block that program then, because we're going to have state money, we're going to have a design, we're going to have pressure from the other towns, it's, and we'll never get the agreement changed. 
And the result will be that we'll be in the same financial bondage for the rest of the century that we're in now. So I would like you to support my substitute motion. Reduce the budget by $700,000, which is close to the cost of this loan, and send a message to the Finance Committee and send a message to the Board of Selectmen that they have to act now, not two or three years from now, when the stakes and the risks are much higher. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's 9.30. Let's take our quick 10-minute break. We'll come right back. Mr. Tosti's up at that. We'll see you in 10 minutes.
<laughs> you like to I love my ma mallet. <laughs> Oh yes, the finger. Yes. yes, that's so you don't dent the desk. I know. I have I have one of these at home for some reason. I've had it for years. Yeah. <coughs> and someone. Oh, I know where I got it. Please take your seats. Mr. Tosti has the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Forty-six is no action. Oh, yeah, I think so. So I have. No. Quiet in the hall. Mr. Tosti has the floor, please. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to recommend strongly uh, that you vote down the proposed resolution on the building program. Uh, okay. I would like to recommend that you vote down the proposed substitute motion of Mr. Foskett uh, that basically attempts to add in two issues into one. What we're, all, we're voting now is the operating budget. What Mr. Foskett is, wants to deal with now is also the future capital budget on the rebuild of Minuteman School. Now, there's two issues here. One's a very practical issue. He's, he's proposing cutting the uh, appropriation by 700,000. Now, if 11 towns out of the 16 vote to approve the budget, which my guess is has probably already happened, we owe the full amount of the assessment. If you cut this by 700000 then the treasurer will be making payments until he runs out of money, and then the Minuteman will say, we want the rest of our money, which is due to us legally. The treasurer will say, I have no appropriation. I cannot give you the money. And then Minuteman will go to court, and court will order us to give them the money wherever the treasurer can pull it, and there often is substantial I mean, penalties uh, that the court can impose on this. So... What we will have to do, if you vote for this substitute motion, is in all likelihood we'll have to have a special town meeting come back in the fall uh, and, and vote the rest of the balance uh, on this. So there's a very practical consideration as to why you know, we don't appropriate this amount of money. Now, on the second issue of the capital, let me just give you a little bit of history. Um, Minuteman needs a rebuild. Uh, it was built back in the mid-70s. Uh, it's been pounded on by thousands of kids over the years, over 30 years. And, and that, that takes a lot out of a school. Um, so Minuteman has, has came before us a couple years ago uh, asking for a feasibility study. Uh, we told them that we want changes in the regional agreement. They set up a task force uh, that I served on to see about changes in the regional agreement and we recommended back to the school committee uh, a ch substantial change in the capital assessment formula. Right now the, the capital assessments is based upon enrollment with a five student minimum. Uh, the task force uh, recommended uh, a substantial change in that so all of the towns have a certain minimum amount of payments. I think we also made recommendations in the, uh, in the operating budget, which haven't gotten a lot of play. Uh, immediate, immediately, as, as word leaked out to the 16 towns, uh, you know, firestorms started popping up that the superintendent had to rush around and try to tamp down. Uh, there's been a collection of the town managers from all the 16 towns that have been working on sort of modifying the formula that, on the capital assessment to get that. Um, so there, there's been a lot of work here, um, but the uh, Minuteman came back to us, primarily as selectmen, but looking for the finance committee and the selectmen to enforce going ahead with the feasibility <coughs> study. 
and he explained that he can't really get somebody to buy into changes. Now, keep in mind that all changes to the regional agreement require a unanimous vote. Every town uh, has a vote, and unless it's unanimous, there's no changes. And, and that's the basic fact that we have to live with. And without a feasibility study, it's very difficult to, to go to towns and see, you know, look about talking about changes when we don't know if this is going to be a $10 million project, a $30 million project, or a $70 million project. And, you know, you're trying to get people to buy in to changes, which in, in some cases will cost them more money. So if, you, if, if the project is a smaller project, the changes are modified, it costs them a smaller amount of money. In the, in the case of fairness, they might just go along with it. On the other hand, if it's a very large project with a very big shift, they're not going to buy that. Why should they vote for changes in the regional agreement that'll cost them more money so Arlington could pay less? Now, there are other factors in selling this because if we can get other towns, which are probably more like Arlington than they are like Weston and Wayland and Dover, then that could help bring them too. So in other words, the changes we want to see not only would benefit Arlington, but could get some substantial, could get additional members in, which would benefit everybody. So the Finance Committee uh, worked and put together a resolution. Um, Steve DeCourcy, our, our uh, uh, Finance Committee representative on Minuteman, Dan Dunn, who has served on the Finance Committee and dealt a lot with these issues. We worked out an agreement. We went before the Finance Committee. We made some more amendments. But basically what that says is we approve you going ahead and spending the feasibility so we can see what magnitude of project we have. But very firmly we said, we will not support changes, uh, we will not support the capital program going ahead unless there are substantial changes to the regional agreement dealing with both assessments and voting authority. And the Finance Committee voted that. It wasn't unanimous, it was, uh, I think it was 12 to 5. Uh, Mr. Dunn that took it to the Board of Selectmen and they discussed it and they voted, I believe, 4 to 1 uh, to go ahead uh, and, and uh, bless Minuteman going ahead with the feasibility study. So, so that's the reason that we went this direction. Uh, my own feeling is if we can't get this down so we know the scope of the project and why it's important and got materials to sell it, we're never going to be able to get changes to the regional agreement. There's just no reason why they should do it. Um, will we have the courage to stand firm and say if there's no changes, we're not voting for this project? Well. I, I believe the Finance Committee will, and I believe the Selectmen will, and I'm, I'm hoping that you will too, uh, because Mr. Foskett is right. These changes have needed to get made. Uh, I just think this is premature. I think we need the feasibility study to move ahead so we can start talking about real numbers. The superintendent has a very difficult issue. He's got to convince 16 towns to go along with changes which might reduce their voting power and increase their cost. And unless you have real numbers, and show them how we could maybe get some more members in and how over the long run this will be a benefit to them, it's not going to happen. So that's the reason the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen uh, moved ahead and voted this way. So for those two reasons, both the practical reason is we have to come back in the fall for a special town meeting just on this issue to appropriate the 700000 and uh, for the reason of uh, being able to move ahead and get substantial changes. Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Dunn and I have been meeting ourselves to try to flesh out some real changes that are both palatable both to the town of Arlington and to the Minuteman district. So I uh, urge you to vote against the substitute motion and for the uh, main motion of the Finance Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hanner. Bill Hayne of Precinct 2. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, uh, through you, uh, have we uh, actually approved the money for the feasibility study? Uh, Mr. F um, Mr. Tosti? Yes, uh, that was done, I think, about a year and a half ago, but there were conditions. And so that is why Minuteman came back to us to ask if they can go ahead with this considering you know, the conditions uh, that were put on. But in effect, yes, the money's available to start. 
they just need our blessing and that's what the finance committee and, and the board of selectmen did so the conditions that were put on i'm not making a, a judgment on it were not necessarily met but they did come back to you and the finance committee and the selectmen have said go forward right thank you uh I, mr moderator through you uh i I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions to the uh, superintendent, if I may. Yep, go ahead and ask your questions. Uh, right now, from the figures uh, that were presented in the slideshow, am I accurate in saying that approximately 42% of the students are non from non-member towns? That's correct. Okay, and uh, of the remaining 58%, Arlington has approximately 30% of the students? Uh, the, there's about 130 students, so I think that's about 31 or 32 okay. percent. Yes. And the law is specific that you cannot put, uh, charge any uh, tuition uh, student with regard to capital? Yes, in, unfortunately, in we've asked the Department of Ed, too, for a legal opinion on this factor. We went and visited with them as well as the Department of Revenue to ask, uh, well, let me just back up, the commissioner every year sets the, not, the Chapter 74 non-resident tuition rate. Minuteman doesn't set that rate. This year, approximately, it's $18,300 per pupil, which does not include transportation and does not include special education. Uh, we asked them if we would, could be considered to um, add a capital fee, which is uh, available to charter schools. Um, they are, took that request under advisement. Um, they sent us another letter, which we're having a meeting on with uh, some other folks from the Mass Association of Vocational Administrators to discuss it with the, uh, uh, the Associate Commissioner at the end of this month. So, if I understand this, right now, Arlington is, a proportionate share is 30 plus percent of, of the member towns. Of, the, uh, of, of all the SPED, all the transportation, and all the capital expenses. Yes. As, okay. Thank you. Um, I agree with Mr. Foskett, and I agree with, uh, with both prior speakers, uh, but I also think a, me a message has to be sent. Uh, will we be successful? I doubt it. Uh, we'll be in a minority. But by sending the message, and does this mean we have to come back in, in November or whenever? Probably. Uh, but I think it's important that we send this message now. I think it's very, very important that we get a proportional representation. If we're paying all this, we should be, have that vote. I lived in a, another town, uh, Pepperell, there was, it was a three-town regional school district. They had to go to court to get that proportional because the smallest town in that group were the Kingmakers. Whichever side they agreed with was the way it went until they had a proportional uh, representation. I would vote to support this. Thank you. Mr. Harrington. Mr. Leonard, did you have questions of the gentleman? No. Okay. Mr. Chappett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator Roland Chappett, Precinct 12. I haven't been up to Minuteman for well over a year now. But I don't want you to get the impression that this is a rickety old place here. The, the school is, was pretty well built 30 odd years ago. Needs some work, yes, but it's not like it's falling apart. In terms of the feasibility study, yes, this is probably necessary. I think the, the comment made by Mr. Tosti is a, is a valid one. We need to go ahead and approve the feasibility study, but then we need to tell the Minuteman school that once we've seen what that shows then we need to make a decision about whether we should go any further on it. I mean the numbers are being bandied around here for anywhere from 30 million to 100 million. That's a huge difference. So we need to see what is really coming about on this. In terms of the programs themselves that are up there, they're very exciting. If you recall last year, if you were here, a couple of the programs were eliminated and a couple of new programs were added that more or less address some of the needs of today's society. Biometrics, I think, was one of those, I recall. Dr. Buchanan can ex expand on this. If you've been watching the information in the newspapers recently, there's an awful lot of 
need for trained people. I mean, trained people who can operate sophisticated machinery or perform operations services in high-level hospitals and so forth. And those are the kinds of jobs that I think a vocational school like Minutemen should be producing for us. So my question, Dr. Bogan, if you don't mind, have you been looking recently at some of the newer programs that could be added into the, uh, the total offering at, at Minuteman that would recognize that, to me anyway, an apparent need for a pretty high level from a technical standpoint of people, not necessarily college bound, some of them probably would be, but many people who are capable if they get trained properly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. We have been engaged in an educational program planning process that was uh, resulted in the closure of some programs and the adding of some others and strengthening of our environmental technology program, our biomanufacturing program. New programs that we're looking at include um, biosecurity as well as animal science, believe it or not, and uh, uh, technical theater engineering. Okay, there you go. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I served on the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School Committee from 1997 through 2001. I ended up doing that because I came onto the floor of town meeting in the days of the 90s where we spent an entire night batting around this budget. When I got on that committee, we were one-third member town students, one-third school choice, one-third Chapter 74 tuition. School choice is $5,000. We had 300 students entering the school under school choice. As a district paying a third of the freight, we had to pay a third of the difference between $5,000 and about $14,000 to, to subsidize the out of district school choice. And four years later, we got the district out of school choice and onto the first step of fiscal stability. The governance issues remain. When I sat there at the school committee meetings, I sat next to a gentleman from Dover who was the school committee member for either one child or two ch children, depending on how big the Dover enrollment was that particular year. I had one vote, he had one vote. Because of the weight of the district, you can get up to the 11 votes required for a two-thirds member town approval of this budget with less than 40% of the membership in terms of population. The governance is broken. This is true. Mr. Foskett raises a valid point. It's a point that we've been making on this floor for as long as I've been in this meeting. I want to tell you, however, that voting down the appropriation here tonight will not change that and won't really send that message. The message comes connected to any renewal of the building. Some of what we're dealing with here is state law in terms of the governance of any regional school district. Some of it is required for bonding for capital projects. For example, if we go forward to build a new school and bond it, you cannot effectively do that without unanimous consent of the member towns and an agreement that binds the towns into the regional agreement permanently or at least through the duration of that bonding. Fact number two, there is a new sheriff in town in terms of the Massachusetts School Building Authority which has been playing hardball with several communities who have had visions of building their new high schools and they said, no, your town is too small, no, it's not a viable project, go and regionalize. 
my impression of the work of this authority. It hasn't run into a situation like Minuteman before, because there really isn't. But my expectation is that this authority is not going to put millions and millions of state dollars into a school in an unviable region. And that's what we have right now is a non-viable region. We do not have the member town students required to support this project. We will need new members. To admit a new member will require changes to the regional agreement. If we admit a city like Watertown, they don't have a moderator to appoint a school committee member, they will need to change the method of selecting the member of the school committee. A lot of governance issues will be changed if there is a need to change the regional agreement to admit a new town. And that is the only way this construction project will be viable. We need a change in that regional agreement. I would not support bonding another nickel for a long-term capital project without a substantive change in the regional agreement. But that's not what's before us tonight. Before us tonight is merely approving the operating budget for the district, which has already been approved by 13 of the 16 towns. It's already above the two-thirds threshold. If we vote this down, if we vote a different number, we send a muddy message which doesn't come to the conclusion that we want, which is a change in governance. Governance of a regional vocational district is governed by state law. There are things we can do and cannot do. One person, one vote does not apply to an appointed committee. It makes sense if the towns are of relatively equal size. It doesn't make sense if one town is a third of the district and one town is a really tiny fraction. A lot of communities have been faced with this issue of either weighted the votes, given certain communities additional votes, or gone to an election scheme in which every town gets to vote on all the members. So, for example, to fill the Arlington seat, that seat would be voted in all 16 town elections. Or we can wait them, vote for them by town, or come up with another appointment method that would work within the context of this district. There are a lot of ways to change it. I know that the state would insist on some sort of a change in the district membership which would require a change in the governance, and a large community would not enter this district under the present political situation. There are plenty of barriers to this regional agreement standing if there is a school re uh, rebuild. Let's not mix the arguments. This is strictly about a routine vote of making an appropriation that was voted by the school committee, if approved by 15 out of 16 members of the finance committee, that is not reversible at this point. I urge you not to muddy the picture, not to cause a, a possible problem in the future, not to come back in September for an expensive special. Vote it with the understanding that this town wants a different agreement and will not go forward past the feasibility study without substantive changes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Doherty, Leo. Leo Doherty, Precinct 19, move the question on all matters of this article. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a two-third vote. We have before us a recommended first, <coughs> excuse me. We have, it's only three of you. We have before us Mr. Foskett's uh, amendment. Oh, really? All right. 
All in favor of terminating debate, please rise. Same tellers. Up front, Mr. Dunn. Nine. Nine to terminate debate up front. This section, this section right here, everybody who wants to terminate debate, please rise. Mr. Schlickman? 25 in my well-behaved section. 25 on the <laughs> left. Mr. Trembley? 29? Mr. McCabe? 31? 25. 25. All opposed to termination, please rise. Same tellers? Mr. Dunn? Two. Two. Mr. Schlickman? Ten. Ten. Mr. Twenty two. Mr. Trembley? Eleven. And Mr. McCabe? Six. The vote is 119 in the positive, 51 in the negative. It is a two-third vote. Debate is terminated. Right. Sir? Huh? Two-thirds, yeah. Half of 119, 60. Yeah. What do you want to do? Question. Okay. Uh, would Mr. Foskett repeat his motion? I'll repeat the motion, Harry. Thank you. It's 119 in the positive, 51 in the negative. Half of 119 is 60, 59. And, and this thing counted. They took, they took away my ability to add two years ago. All right, we have now before us Mr. Foskett's um, motion to amend where he wants to change the figure of $3,222,146 to $2,322,000. Two million three hundred twenty-two thousand one hundred forty-six. He's cutting seven hundred thousand dollars off of their budget. All in favor of Mr. Foskett's amendment, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that is defeated. We now have a force a recommended vote of the Finance Committee. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that is a positive vote as well. That closes debate on Article 45 and brings us to Article 46, recommended vote of no action. Is that still standing? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Finance Committee stand by its vote of no action on this article. However, I just want to tell you it's largely irrelevant now uh, because already nine towns have passed it, so it is the law. So whether you're in favor of it or against it, like I said, uh, it, it's sort of irrelevant. We, we ask you to vote no action, uh, but in effect, it's already going to be implemented. Okay. Uh, we have, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a no action vote. That brings us, what purpose do you rise, sir? Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Um, Andrew, all right, Mr. Fisher has made, which precinct you, Andrew? Andrew Fisher, precinct six, has made a motion to reconsider argue, our article 32. You did serve notice of reconsideration. I assume you voted in the positive when you served notice? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a second on that motion. Motions to reconsider are debatable. Okay. You want to get in the list? Yeah, okay. Mr. Fisher, give us your reasoning for reconsidering. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I placed on your chairs uh, the substance of this on uh, Monday night, 
and I, I placed the actual resolution in the back of the hall and at the front of the hall uh, tonight. However, I'll read. Um, I'm asking to reconsider oh. Article 32 because, as the title clearly states, this article involved much more than a mere report. The title was Article 32, Report Slash Implementation of Consolidated Town School Finance Department. The, uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, this report that was focused on the school emphasized a great deal that in order to consolidate school finance with the town, you first ought to consolidate other offices, such as the treasurers mainly. And the, the DOR report also recommends um, consolidating the, the assessor's office and taking the assessor, board of assessors out of uh, elect, the electoral process. Such a substantive and controversial action requires evaluation. As I mentioned in the Monday evening's handout, it's ironic that we gave an oath in which we pledged to participate fully and evaluate fairly all matters. Yet in Article 32, we did not provide the opportunity to participate fully or evaluate fairly either the report or the recommended action to begin the implementation process. So primarily I'm arguing that we should discuss this and similar to the way with the parking issue, we tested the temperature of town meeting and, and, and to see if it would be worth doing a study. If we had had more opportunity to evaluate the report, I want to pause for a second. If we do reconsider I'm going to offer a resolution which I believe is within the scope because of the fact that Article 32 assumes uh, uh, consolidation of the treasurer's, treasurer's office. And just to remind you what the uh, resolution would be, it states, and this was on your, de on your seats um, Monday night, but I've refined it, resolved that until such time that the town meeting votes to implement the consolidation of town finance functions. Town meeting disapproves of any expenditure of town resources, including meetings of the stakeholders, for the purpose of implementing consolidation of town and or school finance functions, or that could lead to a comprehensive plan to be voted on next year at town meeting regarding such a plan. Notice that I've said town meeting disapproves. It's well known that town meeting cannot tell the administration what to do, but we can tell them what we think. Um, can, um, Mr. Good, can can you put the Mr. Good, can you put the um, Mass Department of Revenue transitioning government elected to appointed thing up? that I, I sent to you. Uh, the Department of Revenue has a, a basic program with a kind of a manual titled Transitioning Government Elected to Appointed. This, this is printed off of the uh, website. And page four, it, it's their program, it's what they do. So when you ask for them to come do a study, you know what the recommendations are going to be because it's in here. It says, uh, the page three is, why do we recommend transitioning from elected to appointed? Page four says, what positions do we typically identify to convert? The treasurer, the collector, the assessor. Um, okay, okay, thank you. It's, it's very clear. So the question arises, if, if we know what their program is, why would we ask them to do the study? Um, it kind of explains perhaps why they discovered that we had a problem with the uh, State Street incident, but they don't, didn't go further and explore 
something uh, that occurred with the retirement board where town administrators and others pressured the, the retirement board to go into the state pension fund. Um, and this just demonstrates the gravity of the situation. Uh, when we did that, we lost 30% of the value of the, the pension trust. Towns that stayed out of it lost about 25%. Uh, and I'm, I'm bringing this up not because that the treasurer manages this pension fund. No, no, no. He over, what's the right word? He, do, he, he does what, it's, it's within the scope because I'm talking about the kinds of pressures that are exerted on these independent boards and it happens routinely. Um, and I, it just, just the bias of this report is, is so strong towards reorganization and it was prejudged. Um, The conflict regarding this consolidation is profound and distracting to all involved. It's an energy drain. Whether one supports it or one opposes it, I think we can all see that there's no sense in investing staff time to construct a thorough plan of action to consolidate, only to have the plan rejected next year in town meeting. Above all, a state level report may or may not reflect, reflect the will of town meeting. The administration should not involve the town in a top-down process, invest enormous time and energy, and put town meeting in the bind of feeling obligated to vote yes because it is too late in the process. It's not worth the bad feelings or the waste of time. Sometimes it seems that instead of being a deliberative body, we behave as if we are a competitive one. Please vote to reconsider Article 32 so we can deliberate and evaluate fairly the question. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, just the ground rules, what we're doing, we're voting to reconsider, we're now debating whether or not we want to reconsider, and reconsider does take a two-thirds vote of this meeting. Mr. Tosti, you're next. Point of order. Sir, what's your point of order? Joseph Curo, Precinct 15, is a motion to uh, reconsider actually debatable? Yeah. Yeah, look at the very bottom. Two up from the bottom. I'm looking at it. Follow over. See that little dot? It says, as with the main motion. Same rank. Thank you. Got it. I'll start you again, Mr. Tosti. I would ask you not to reconsider this article. Uh, just on the one point that was made, the Department of Revenue studied cons financial consolidation because that's what they were asked to study. They weren't asked to study the retirement board. They weren't asked to study anything else. This is what they were asked to study. Uh, Mr. Fisher's is a sort of a chicken and the egg proposal. Town meeting can't implement or approve the implementation of a consolidated finance department unless the town manager puts a plan before you that says exactly what it'll look like. We'll have this here, this will report to you, a whole t a framework, boxes and lines, uh, and how much money this is going to cost, how much money it's not going to cost, will it save or cost more money, these are the pluses and these are the minuses. We've got the, we've got the proposal from DOR, we've got the study from DOR, but that's not an implementation plan. In effect, this is forbidding the town manager from going ahead, meeting, studying, and putting together a plan to present to you next year that'll have all the little boxes and charts and cost benefits and pros and cons. That's what we need before the town meeting can discuss it and decide whether they want to go in that direction or leave it the same. Now there's, there's been meetings going on. For example, we had a meeting a few weeks ago about the offsets. You know, that the water and sewer offsets weren't quite as, uh, you know, weren't quite as they would like it to be. And, we came to the conclusion that our offsets are fine, but we need, need to do more, con 
more transparency, I suppose, in how to do it. So next year's Finance Committee report will be lay out those a little bit better uh, so we can do that. And there'll be other parts of the report that's done too. So again, I urge you to not vote reconsideration and, and probably debate this for three nights, but to give the new town manager a chance to, to meet with people, to figure out the, co the benefits and, and uh, costs, and propose to you next year a plan that you can discuss and vote up or, or vote down. Uh, so again, I'd urge you to vote uh, to not vote to reconsider and to move on to the other business of the town. Thank you. Yes, sir. Who said that? Mr. McCourt, Q, Q, Q McCurry. Our bylaws, our bylaws overrule that. Our bylaws overrule that, Mr. Um, uh, he, he says it's not a two-third vote. Our bylaws, Article Two, Article One, Title One, Article One, Section Ten E. There can be no reconsideration of a vote once reconsideration. Blah blah blah, unless ordered by vote of two-thirds of town meeting members present and voting. Thank you, um, Mr. Peluso. You're next. Ted Peluso, precinct number six. You have now arrived at what is closest to my heart. Uh, consolidation should be looked at. Consolidation should be looked at whether you eliminate positions, whether you appoint positions, whether you elect positions. It should be looked at. The problem is simple. Uh, the Department of Revenue report was accepted by the Town Government Reorganization Committee. And it was accepted except for the issues having to do with appointed versus elected officials. And in fact, the vote of the Town Government Reorganization Committee was for in favor of accepting it, but ignoring the elected versus appointed position in the Department of Revenue report. One, in favor of accepting it, including, this is only accepting it, not acting on it, uh, including uh, uh, the, uh, the, the whole issue of appointed versus elected officials. And four, four, uh, what's the word? No opinion, including me, okay? Four of us said, we think you should look at it. That's what it really came down to. Now, to me, uh, what I happen to favor looking at consolidation. I think some of you know I was in business as a CPA auditing municipalities for many, many years. I think there's a lot of potential if you do it right. My concern almost one year ago to the day, it was in June, was after the, uh, the vote that accepted whatever that article number was, 34, was what happens if it gets voted down after the Department of Revenue report comes out? We've wasted another year because we're not going to look at it because we're into the personnel issues, okay? So uh, what, what I'm suggesting is as follows. We should not reconsider Article 32. Right number? We should not. But the sense of this group should be when you folks get together, the folks being the superintendent of schools, the town manager, the town treasurer, do it together, and I'll use my own words, like grown-ups. <laughs> Look at it and say, what makes sense? You did something a few years ago with 
it, it with the IT, and it seems to work pretty good. John Billifer, if he's still in the room, uh, by his own admission, uh, created a consolidated payroll department. I don't think anybody voted on that. At least he would remember. I certainly wouldn't. I wasn't around. And it works pretty good. So I guess what I'm saying is don't reconsider Article 32. But however you get the message across to the executives who are paid professionals in our town that you can get it across, tell them to look at it from all viewpoints. Tell them to look at it whether you have an appointed treasurer, an elected treasurer. Tell them to come up with something that will work. Tell them to come up with something where when they make a presentation to us a year from now, so now we'll already be into two years without consolidation or even looking at it, right? When they come back a year from now, everybody will say, well, you know what? If everybody agrees, why not? Because I think you can agree, okay? Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Worden, Precinct 8. I think we, sh we should uh, reconsider this, um, uh, uh, if, if only because we really did not have an opportunity uh, for debate under Article 32, uh, you having ruled um, that it was receipt of a report and we don't debate reports. Um, my, um, my position would be that the reports we don't debate are those received under Article, this year Article 3, usually Article 2, um, that are reports of our own committees that we have appointed. We, the town meeting or our moderator, our officials have appointed, and they report to us uh, year after year and until they stop doing so, and then maybe we'll get them dissolved some, sometimes. Um, uh, but this was a report by an outside agency. And it was a report by an outside agency, which, as Mr. Fisher has pointed out, by their own admission, uh, has a prejudice against the people electing those who govern and administer for them. Um, and, and it is a report that, as Mr. Gilligan pointed out, contained an egregious error of fact, and in fact a slander, upon the present uh, holder of the office of treasurer. Um, and so, uh, I, and, and as Mr. Peluso pointed out, um, the, um, the town uh, government reorganization committee upon which both he and I and our distinguished moderator and, and, and others serve, uh, voted twice, once at the very outset, that we were not going to take up the issue of depriving the voters of Arlington of the right to elect certain officials such as the treasurer, the assessor, the clerks, and so on, the clerk, and so on. Uh, and we voted that again uh, at, at our very, I think it was our very final meeting by the vote that uh, was oddly characterized by four abstentions. Uh, I guess if those four people had felt that we should uh, discuss this, they would have voted uh, with the one, uh, join the one negative vote uh, and made it a four to five and, and thus approved the possible elimination of elected officers. So if this were to be reconsidered, uh, I would, um, and, and, or if we had had an opportunity to discuss the matter uh, the other night when it first came up, uh, I would have moved to amend the, uh, uh, the, the, the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen by, by, uh, by adding, uh, after the word uh, that the report be received, except that we, we reject the uh, uh, the uh, erroneous uh, uh, attack upon the activities of the town treasurer with regard to the State Street matter, and we reject any suggestion that the people of Arlington be denied the right to elect their town officials. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Swilling. Moderator, Nathan Swilling, Precinct 4. I move to terminate debate on this article and all matters that are under. Okay, moving to, okay, moving to terminate debate on the reconsideration of the article. 
Okay. All in favor of terminating debate on reconsideration, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. no. My opinion, the, it is terminated. We now have before us Mr. Fisher's motion for reconsideration. Again, I'll state it, it does require a two-thirds vote to reconsider. All in favor of reconsideration, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a negative vote. Reconsideration did not win. Nope. That brings us to Article 25. Leaf blowers. <laughs> Which we did vote down two years ago. Okay. We have, wait. Well, what's her name? Cacavaro? Yeah. We have before us a recommended vote of no action. Does anybody have a substitute motion? Miss Ben, you're up. Wait. Everybody who wants to talk, put their hand up and save them there until Stephanie or I point at you or both of us. Oh, wait, she never talks. Let's get her. Hi, I'm Carol Band, Precinct 8. I just sent the guy home with a leaf blower. I had rented one and I didn't think we'd get to this tonight and he just left. But <laughs> um, Several years ago, an article to ban gas-powered leaf blowers came before town meeting and it was narrowly defeated. Since then, I've been approached by scores of people, not just in my precinct, but all across town, asking that we re revisit this issue. So my substitute amendment seeks to prohibit the use of gas-powered blowers on private property. Precincts 8 and 10 and 12 produce a neighborhood newsletter, and just a few years ago, they conducted a poll and asked folks what they didn't like about their neighborhoods. The number one answer was noise specifically noise from leaf blowers. No one enjoys the noise from leaf blowers. No one's glad when a landscaping crew pulls up with three leaf blowers going outside and makes working from home or sitting on your front porch intolerable. But we put up with it because we're good. Do yeah. you actually have a substitute motion you're going to submit to me oh, and I? get seconded? Oh, didn't I do that? Well, you, you've given me a few. You haven't put them before the meeting and gotten them seconded yet. Yeah, you keep going. But I want to know which one you're doing. <laughs> Loud or Carol? You have a second? Sorry. Thank you. My Go ahead, you're ticking. Up. Can yeah. I keep going? Okay. Yeah, no yeah, yeah. Okay, so no one likes the noise from leaf blowers, but we put up with it because we're good neighbors. We tell ourselves that it's only loud when the next door neighbors have their yard done, or when the neighbors on the other side do, or the guy across the street, or the people who live behind us, or the people four doors down or five doors down, because we don't want to make a fuss. But we should make a fuss because the noise and the pollution and the toxic dust that leaf blowers create are affecting our physical health, our mental well-being, and the quality of life in our homes and in our town. I put up with it, though. I work from home. It's a really cushy deal. Just ask my husband. But there's many days when landscape crews prevent me from eating my lunch on the porch or working in my kitchen or talking on the phone or having a conference call. My husband, who goes to an office every day, thought I was overreacting until he worked from home last Monday, that really gorgeous day. I thought I was going to go insane, he said, from the noise. And that was his exact quote. And he's not alone. Arlington is a very dense community, and I think that's terrific. It generally, it means that we know our neighbors. We don't have two-acre zoning. We have little yards and houses that are close together. When there's a leaf blower in my neighbor's yard, I hear it. I breathe the dust. I can't get 50 feet away from them, even if I'm standing in my kitchen. It affects everybody. It's like secondhand smoke. Today, the idea of sitting in a smoke-filled airplane seems unfathomable because we stood up for our health. We learned the facts and we responded. We took back airplanes and restaurants and our workplace from the dangers of secondhand smoke, and now we need to have the wisdom to take back our homes, our yards, 
and our community from the assault of toxins, noise, and pollution generated by leaf blowers. Now we know better. Leaf blowers are a recent phenomena. They were invented in Japan to dust crops. Before 1972, everybody raked their leaves, even landscapers. But someone got the idea that you could use the crop dusters to blow debris off of yards, driveways, and sidewalks. And the 200 mile an hour cyclone force winds that these machines produced worked. The leaves moved. But so did topsoil, and with it, clouds of toxic dust com containing animal feces, bird droppings, lead, mold, spores, chemicals, and pesticides. These dust clouds and their particulates linger in the air for hours, even days, and kids breathe them, babies in strollers bask in them, and old people on their porches inhale them. There's bacteria that can cause respiratory infections, chemicals that are known carcinogens. One neighbor wrote to me to say that the soil from his organic vegetable garden right here in Arlington was contaminated by airborne toxins from his neighbor's landscaper. He had his soil tested at UMass. So have a nice day. That's hard to do here in Arlington during leaf blower season because the roar of the two-stroke engines has become the soundtrack of spring, summer, and fall. Remember when people burned their leaves? But someone decided that smoke from burning leaves was contributing to air pollution, and it was, so we did something about it. Yet leaf blowers produce not only air polluting emissions, they also kick up toxic dust and make our quiet neighborhoods sound like NASCAR racetracks. I've lived here in Arlington for 26 years. I moved here when I was an infant. Um, it's, <laughs> it's an amazing town with amazing people, like everybody here who comes to town meeting and stays here till 11 o'clock at night, and who just a couple of years ago voted to help Arlington become a designated green community. And that wasn't just about getting grant money. It was about being forward thinking and doing what's right for Arlington and what's right for the future. More and more communities are doing what's right. Brookline, Cambridge, and Belmont have all enacted tough leaf blower restrictions, and lots of other communities are talking about it. Over 400 towns across the country, and Marblehead votes this week. It's the beginning of a movement towards sanity, towards taking back our towns and preserving the health of our citizens. It's not just about being considerate of your neighbors and treading lightly on the earth. It's about preserving the health of our community and the people who live here. It's about taking a stand to protect what's important. And now we know. The landscape companies, just like the tobacco companies, they'll survive. They work for us, and if we demand safe methods for removing leaves, if they want our business, they'll comply. And they have. In towns and cities all across the country where leaf blowers have been banned, landscapers are employing rakes, and guess what? They haven't gone out of business. And the prices they charge haven't gone up, just like they didn't go down when leaf blowers started being used in the 70s. That leaf blowers are more effective remains debatable. And is efficiency the only measure of merit? What about quality of life? What about the impact on health? It would be a lot more efficient and easier not to recycle. It would be easier to burn our leaves. It would be easier not to ban smoking. But our thinking has evolved, and now we know better. So on behalf of my neighbors and yours, I'm asking you to help take back our neighborhoods to help return peace and quiet to our homes and to our yards, to help restore air that's free of toxins to our town so that parents can let their kids play outside without worry and so that everyone can enjoy living in their homes and relaxing in their yards in good conscience and in good health. Thank you. And now I would like to call upon Eli Gerzon. Eli, are you here? Who is a local landscaper? A and a resident of Arlington. Hi, my name is Eli Gerzon. I'm also a longtime resident of Arlington, a uh, proud graduate of Bishop School. Um, yeah, so I've run my landscaping business for 10 years. Um, most of my clients are in Arlington and surrounding towns also. And I've never used leaf blowers. It's, I find it totally unnecessary. And I think that my prices are perfectly reasonable. It's not something I factor in. It's not something that uh, affects it. And I, um, yeah, I don't know what else to add. <laughs> um, you don't have to. I, I would welcome, I would welcome this as a resident. Uh, also, it's, it, it is something that really bothers me, uh, the noise and the, um, and the pollution and everything. So thank you. Thank you.
What's your point of order? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Um, the Warren article specifically reads gas-powered leaf blowers. Yes. The, the motion I have just says leaf blowers. Is it in order? No, she was supposed to have told you. You want to correct it, Ms. Bann? Yeah, she was supposed to have told. She came up to me after the last meeting, said she forgot to add the words gas-powered, and she would ask if it could be carried in during her presentation. It's on mine, and actually it's the one that yes, says. Yes, I would like to have the word gas-powered carried in. After the words, the use of? After the words, the, words, the use blower. of, yes, and before leaf blower. Fine okay. with me. I just wanted to make it clear. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you, sir. That. Yeah, the motion, it's, it's, I don't know if there were one or two in your chairs. I had been given two. That's why I was a little unsure which one it was. It voted Article 12, noise abatement of Title 5 of the town bylaws being hereby is amended by adding the words, other than leaf blowers used on private property, to the end of paragraph J of section two and adding the following new paragraph D to section three. D, leaf blowers. The use of gas powered leaf blowers on private property is prohibited. Signed, Carol Band. Okay, we all know which one we're doing with now. Miss. We'll go over it again before we vote, but basically she doesn't want you to use gas powered leaf blowers. Megan Henning, Precinct 19. Um, I rise to address this issue because this is the first time in my two years as a town meeting member that a member of my precinct has actually contacted me because they want us to vote a particular way on an issue. Um, and a, a number of people in the no, community have the gave me. Um, mentioned that this is something they want us to really take seriously this year. But also, as a, for the majority of my life, I grew up in the Midwest and uh, we had an acre and a half and I can tell you that with a rake, we did our acre and a half in a fraction of the time that it takes three guys with jet packs on their back to do a postage stamp yard in the town of Arlington. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know, well, I do know what they're doing. They're blowing particles and debris into my organic soil. That's what they're doing. And it needs to stop. Thank you. Mr. Cacavaro. Thomas Cacavaro, Precinct 11. What amazes me the most about this article is the 10 registered voters have nothing to worry about in their life. They don't have to worry about a job, food, bills, anything that we have to worry about, but they have to worry about leaf blowers. It's amazing. I, I wish they can tell me the secret so I can be like them. And then. I, I, I believe I heard that Precinct 8, 10, and 12 did their own little survey and came up with, they don't like leaf blowers. Well, how about the rest of the town? Does the rest of the town count? I thought we're here to do what's best for the whole town, not just one, two, three precincts. And it will cost the customer more money. Don't let that fool you. If it takes 20 minutes for someone to blow your leaves and they have to rake it in two hours, it's going to cost you money. There's a lot of things that's harmful to our health out there in the air. There's a lot of noises out there. Should we pass this and then next year lawnmowers and then why don't we just get rid of the cars? What's the difference? You have a motorcycle go up and down your street as long as it's insured, registered, and the person has a license and he's not speeding, he can go up and down that street all he wants all day long. That's more noisier than a leaf blower. I don't see the big concern. I asked the police chief a little early, a little while ago, how many complaints have we've had? He had to think about it. He said, maybe I had something on a Sunday, and I agree with him. If somebody's out there on a Sunday blowing with a leaf blower, the guy should get arrested. 
but he didn't have any complaints. And frankly, I'm tired of hearing about other towns and cities. I happen to like this town. So if you want to make this town into something else, you should move into that town. And then you don't have to worry about leaf blows. Maybe they've already passed the law and you can worry about birds. I don't know. This is, once again, we're going to sit here. It came up two years ago, and now we're here again doing this. This is going to open up a can of worms for anybody to come up next year and ask for something else. I, I really suggest to vote it down because I don't think it's, it's good for the whole town, and I don't think the whole town wants this. Thank you. Mrs. Broadman. Janice Broadman, Precinct 15. Um, I have to say, coming up after Carol feels a little bit like coming up after the Rolling Stones. I mean, that was passionate. And I, um, and I appreciate you know, how strongly she feels about it. And I also uh, eat organic food. I uh, you know, go to the local farms. I'm concerned about the environment. I do a lot of stuff for that. <clears throat> but this particular... Uh, article I think has a lot of problems and I actually I it, it was such a curious one to me that I you know that somebody felt that strongly about leaf leaf blowers mm -hmm. that I actually mm -hmm. called Belmont Lexington Medford and Winchester to see if they had uh, a ban so unlike what Carol somehow heard about Belmont they do not none of them have bans on leaf uh, gas powered leaf blowers uh, they do have noise ordinances, as do we. Uh, they're all pretty much the same. It's over so many 70 to 85 decibels. It's not before 7 o'clock in the morning, not after 8 o'clock at night. Um, so I think we have something in place. It's called a noise uh, you know, pollution ordinance. Uh, I think it works. And I think the... Imp and then I, I actually did a little Google search, and I found a statement from... Green, uh, a bunch of companies in California that, um, that are kind of green companies, they do lawn care. And they wrote up something um, very interesting and, and basically said, uh, I guess it, this kind of thing had come up in California, and they said if, if this passes, it will put people out of business. It takes five times as long to, and I'm not a landscaper, so um, I have no dog in this fight other than to look at it and say, you know, that takes five times as long to, uh, to do it with rakes, and for a lot of companies it would put them out of business. My experience has not been uh, so significant. I mean, I, I, I've lived in Arlington a long time, you know, about 20 years, and I um, have neighbors that use gas-powered blowers or have a commercial company, and I don't, and you know, they're usually gone in five minutes. Yeah, for five minutes I have, you know, noise, but they're usually gone really quickly, and I think the impact on me to deal with that noise for five minutes, or to, I don't see dust storms or anything like that, um, is a lot less than the impact on these companies if they you know, have actually do go out of business or lose jobs or people lose uh, jobs. So I, um, I think that all in all that it's more important to just realize we have a law, it's a reasonable law, and that um, the negative impact on some of our neighbors, a lot of our neighbors, I assume, who do this sort of thing, some don't use these leaf blowers, but some do, is very significant compared to the five or maybe 10 minutes that we have to put up with, a, with some noise. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> the gentleman next to Ms. LaCourt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My, <clears throat> my name is Jeremy Marin, uh, Precinct 16. I want to apologize in advance. This is the most boring public speech I've ever given in my life. Uh, I, uh, a lot of people have asked me questions about why I feel that leaf blowers pose a health threat uh, to, to uh, the community. 
I'd like to answer those questions. I also want to point out that I have um, uh, citations for all of the information that I'm about to give, which will make one Arlington List member very happy. Um, <laughs> if, <clears throat> if, if leaf blowers moved only leaves, you would not see me here tonight. Um, the problem is that they don't just blow the leaves, they blow everything. Uh, the, uh, if I stood here and I pulled a handful of lead dust, toxins, carcinogens, and I blew it, I bet the people in the front row would be pretty darn angry with me, and with good reason. But the reality is, that is exactly what's happening with the leaf blowers. Uh, and it's for that reason that I think I encourage people to support the article today. These machines create uh, winds 180 to 200, uh, excuse me, 150 to 280 miles per hour, frequ frequently multiple units working simultaneously, often for a half hour or more. All, these all of these problem chemicals are then blown into neighboring yards, gardens, onto lawn furniture, kids play things through open and through open windows. There we go, I got it. Leaf blowers create winds of 150 to 280 miles per hour. As you can see, that exceeds the wind speeds of both Category 5 hurricanes and tornadoes. With uh, that kind of wind speed, I would humbly offer that the slower if the slower speeds of tornadoes and hurricanes can lift cars and cows, that a leaf blower can lift dust, as well as the toxins that are contained within the top layer of soil. It's illegal for me to take my garbage and throw it onto your property. I like that law. It's also illegal for me to take a bag of lead paint chips and throw it onto your property. It's also illegal if I took a handful of asbestos uh, and did that. If I did any of those things, a hazmat team would be called to the property and I would be arrested with good reason. However, it's considered acceptable behavior for people to use leaf blowers that produce winds in excess of 150 miles per hour to raise dust that may include items such as lead, toxic pesticides and herbicides, animal feces, mold spores, and heavy metals. These clouds of dust don't magically disappear. They float onto other people's property, same way as if I picked them up and threw them over the fence. They go through open windows, and they shower people who are walking past. It's therefore not a question of asking your neighbor to stop using leaf blowers. Each of us is put in the path of this toxic cloud. Whether your immediate neighbor uses one, whether you're walking somebody on the way to your child's school is using one, whether your neighbor across, uh, a neighbor of a friend across town is using one. For those who question reasonably how dangerous these clouds of dust might be, I would ask you to please consider this. The, the National Academy of Sciences estimates that homeowners utilize 10 times more fertilizer and pesticides, <laughs> Gesundheit, 10 times more fertilizer and pesticides per acre than farmers. That's 10 times more than farmers, the average homeowner uses. Throughout the summer, we see a wide variety of these signs in different forms and colors and shapes pop up in yards around town. They all say, as you can see, caution, pesticide application, keep off. The signs are there for a very good reason, and I hope you'll bear with me as I very, very, very quickly run through the most boring thing I've ever described in my life. Variety of chemicals that are on lawns around town. This is uh, part of the MSDS, the safety sheet for a chemical called 2,4-D. The uh, the official name is very long and complicated, which, and I can't pronounce it. I can tell you, however, that the chemical has been banned in Quebec, and it has been found in many studies to be a possible human carcinogen. It has been found to be linked to car to lymphoma, lymphoma, cause cell damage, hormonal disruption, and reproductive problems. Again, I've got citations for all this. Studies have also shown that 2,4-D enters maternal milk and semen. As you can see uh, in the slide behind me, 2,4-D has been found to create a whole host of health issues, safety hazards, notably through skin exposure and skin contact. One of the first warnings is to keep the herbicide out of the reach of children. Avoid contact with the skin, eyes, and clothing, and do not inhale the fumes. All of this is, of course, is rather difficult when you are being showered with a uh, with dust that has been raised from somebody's lawn that is covered with 2,4-D. 2,4-D, again, most popular herbicide in the United States. If you have a weed and feed, it's in there. If you've got a variety of other fertilizer, uh, uh, weed killers, herbicides, it's in there. It's everywhere. Uh, according to the National Resources Defense Council, quote, 
Residues of 2,4-D on children's hands and in their urine have been shown to correlate closely with the levels of 2,4-D in carpet dust, demonstrating that the contamination from dust is how this chemical enters children body, children's bodies." End quote. Another favorite herbicide that's used in the United States, but banned in the European Union, atrazine, that one I can pronounce, is one of the most widely used herbicides in the world. Atrazine is an endocrine disruptor. Good stuff possible carcinogen and has been connected to low sperm levels. That's, uh, gentlemen, you got that? Um, the half-life of atrazine ranges from 13 to 261 days. That's the half-life. That is plenty long enough for leaf blowers to spread it around the neighborhood long after it has been applied. Lead. A lot of people are familiar with the lead paint issues, lead from uh, gasoline. It's in, every, it's in a lot of yards. Uh, it's a very serious concern as lead paint flake has flaked off or continues to flake off or has been scraped off. The soil in the surrounding area gets contaminated with lead. According to the Massachusetts DEP, quote, children can become exposed to lead when playing with in the dirt and tracking it into the house on their shoes and clothing. They go on to say, quote, during the summer months when dust is a problem, clean window sills with a damp cloth or sponge once a week. That is because it is going through the window, through the window screen, and landing on the sill. Those, again, a lot of people question, does this stuff actually get airborne? Clearly, it does if, you're suppo if the uh, state and other agencies are encouraging you to wipe off your window sill. Um, all right, Mr. Good, if you could help me out and put me to the next slide. There we go. Yeah, the next one. There we go, that one. Uh, this is a picture uh, of, uh, this is the reason that I actually started to actively support this uh, article. The picture you see was taken uh, just over a month ago. On the right, what you see is a, an, an outbuilding that is flaking lead dust. On this side is the um, uh, raised bed that I built in order to, uh, because the, the soil in that area was contaminated with lead. Unfortunately, the, fo the photo was taken with uh, my cell phone, so the poor quality, I apologize, but I think that you get the point. I built that raised bed so I could have uh, still grow vegetables even though the soil at ground level was contaminated with lead. As you can see in the photo there, there's a tremendous amount of dust that's being raised between that building and the raised bed there. Um, uh, I'm going to skip over some stuff. Pollen and mold is uh, pollen and mold. I don't think I need to elaborate on that one. That also gets raised up by these uh, machines. Uh, small particulate of 2 point, it's called PM 2.5, uh, 2.5 micrometers in diameter and smaller. It's 1 30th the size of a human hair. Particles under this size are considered dangerous because they lodge in the lungs, creating an array of potential problems. From the EPA, health study, quote, health studies have shown a significant association between exposure to fine particles and premature death from heart or lung disease. Uh, in 2010, the California Air Resources Board found that fine particles result in 9,000 premature deaths each year there. Finally, everybody's favorite topic, poop. Uh, beyond the ick factor, animal feces often contain a variety of things that are potentially dangerous to inhale, including toxoplos toxoplasmosis oocysts, which are especially dangerous to pregnant women and young children, potentially resulting in a variety of birth defects and severe illnesses that can last for years. So all of that stuff is on the soil surface. Does it get into the air? The answer is yes. Um, yeah, yeah, all right, that's what good. We'll take that one. Uh, the California Air Resources Board did a study specifically on leaf blowers and reported the, co the conclusions in the slide behind me. Among them, health effects from hazards identified as being generated by leaf blowers range from mild to serious, but the appearance of those effects depends on exposures, the dose, or how much of the hazard is received by a person. Um, uh, I went through all this not, to, not as a hazmat class, but because these are some of the things that leaf blowers lift from the ground and blow around. I think it's important to realize just what the leaf blowers are doing, what they're whipping up into the air, sending into our backyards, through open windows, into our kids' sandboxes and jungle gyms. The, real, the reality is that leaf blowers create a health hazard, especially for the young, women, uh, the elderly, and women of childbearing age. Lim the limits of personal fruit freedom end when it affects the health of others. If you saw me walking through your yard, sprinkling lead and animal feces on your patio, and tossing it through your open windows, you'd have me arrested. If you saw me running through the streets, tossing handfuls of carcinogenic toxins and endocrine disruptors in the air along your child's route to school, you'd call the police. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the same thing is effectively happening every day in Arlington. I'm asking you to please put an end to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. What? Okay, motion to any mo notices of reconsideration? 44, 45, and 46 by Mr. Tosti. All in favor of adjournment, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. We are adjourned. I'll keep the same list next week. <laughs>